Let's embrace it. Let's do it. Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get, let's face it, the world's most interesting folks focusing on building a better future. Today, we've got somebody who's definitely doing that in a dynamic way. Michelle Romano, not to be confused with Romanoff on the program. Thanks for coming today, Michelle. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Michelle, we've got a dragon on and I hear you breathe fire. Tell me quickly about your background. How did you get into entrepreneurship and become, a, become an ass kicker? Oh my goodness. Uh, by probably getting my ass kicked myself <laughs> is, uh, is the best way to answer that question. You know, my, my journey wasn't very linear. I mean, I started off in engineering school, did an MBA. By the time I had graduated, figured out that worldwide supply of sturgeon caviar, of all things, supply was down by 95% because we had overfished the Caspian Sea. So I was crazy enough to move to the East Coast and build a fishery from scratch. This is everything it sounds like. Boats, fishermen, my hands knee deep in fish, like the whole nine yards. And um, we were cracked. Chefs couldn't get the product, so we had no problem selling it. But then we went into a giant recession in 2008. Um, from there, I ended up you know, getting the only job I could at a big retailer, um, seeing that e-commerce was blowing up, and started an e-commerce company in Canada you know, 2010 called Bytopia. We didn't raise any money, but ended up becoming one of the fastest growing Canadian companies and then sustained our growth by actually buying a series of our competitors. And so I think we bought two or three companies that had raised more than $50 million in in venture capital that had burned it, which is an interesting theme kind of going forward. Um, So that company has done quite well. And then from there, started another app called SnapSaves that digitized coupons for the consumer package in space. So our customers were Coca-Cola and Procter and Gamble. Um, and that company was acquired by Groupon in 2014. It was then that I joined the cast of Dragon's Den, which is Canada's uh, shark tank. And so I've done the show for five seasons um, now. And it was really a lot of the inspiration behind ClearBank. Because what happens when we film the television show is that we see 250 pitches in something like 17 days, a huge amount of pitches. And, you know, I just kept seeing these founders that were coming on the show that, you know, they had stuff like this wooden iPhone case, you know, it was a father son team um, that had made them, they'd done almost a million dollars in sales and they came on the show and they were like, look, we have great unit economics. We make each case for 10 bucks have $10 in Facebook ads, been and t- sell it for 50 bucks. And we're here on the show looking for a hundred thousand dollars for our company in exchange for, for 20% of the company. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Like this is, you know, these, these founders are going to be really resentful when I own 20% of their company. The iPhone case probably company is probably not going to sell to Apple. And but these, these guys really do need the capital. And so on the show for fun, I was like, look, I'm going to throw it a totally different deal type. I'll give you the $100,000. I'm not going to take any equity. What I want instead is a revenue share. So I want 5% of your revenue until I'm paid back $106,000. And and, uh, after you pay me back, you know, 6% flat fee, I'm out of there. (laughs) And so the founders obviously loved it. I said there was one catch, which is that I had to see your Facebook data. Um, and it was crazy because we've basically gone, um, you know, from from that tiny idea to that is what ClearBank became. Is that today founders are spending forty percent of their venture capital dollars directly on Facebook, Google, and and user acquisition. And so we thought there was a way cheaper way to do that that didn't use equity, so you're not diluting yourself and giving up part of your company. And uh, this year we'll give founders a billion dollars in capital on the same revenue share agreements that I started on the show uh, about five years ago. Basically, it's the revenue share. It's the it's the Kevin O'Leary model without holding the gun to the mom's head, type, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. In terms of the in terms of the evil, I've I've definitely seen similar things as well. And with uh with the ad spend economy right now, I've heard a huge portion of Facebook and Google's actual revenue is is uh, click fraud, anyways, which. It's, um, it's an interesting little potential bubble that's building there in that ad space. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, there, since the beginning of time with advertising, CMOs have said, I'm wasting half of my marketing budget. I just never know what how. And so I think compared to, you know, even with digital, there are, there are certainly um, cases of fraud. There's cases of things not happening, but you can directly measure it. 
you know that every time you sell a bed in a box mattress, it's costing you a hundred bucks a customer and you're never paying kind of a dollar more and you can measure that, which is I think amazing and, and allowed all of these direct to consumer brands um, to be built. And so, you know, the ad platforms are never going to be perfect. They're going to need, you know, lots of other tracking tools and competitors to keep them honest. Uh, but I still think compared to growing up in the generation where I was buying newspaper ads for my first website, you know, digital is a lot better uh, than kind of what, what the existing ad technologies used to be. So you basically built a Groupon and then sold it to Groupon and you <laughs> did it really, really quickly. What was, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, so we, we actually built, so the, the app that we sold to Groupon um, was in the CPG space. So it was a, it was an add on that was, that was in a different story. I mean, what did we do? Well, we learned um, that, that we couldn't spend a lot of money on customer acquisition. And so we had to be really creative with that customer acquisition was probably the most important. Um, because the problem with e-commerce companies is if you're spending more than you're making on acquiring every customer, you're counting on a customer to buy from you three or four times before you break even on that initial cost. And that's fine if you raised $100 million of venture capital, uh, but it's not fine if, if you don't have that. And so um, we just became incredibly creative with trying everything that was different. We tried newspaper ads that actually worked for a really long time for us because no one else was doing it. Um, we tried creative referral programs. We actually you know, talked to some of our customers. There was all sorts of things that we did um, that, that really allowed us to grow quickly without spending a lot of money. What do you think about this dichotomy that's building and all of these big facing IPOs we're having where almost no, none of the companies are profitable? Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a bigger story here with the IPOs, which is that you know, today the founders are owning very little of their companies when they go public. So, I mean, if you look at Lyft, that's certainly seen as a success of the last decade. I mean, the founders of Lyft own three and a half percent of Lyft today. I mean, they, they totally built that company. And if you compare that with a company 20 years ago, like Microsoft, I mean, Bill Gates owned 49% of Microsoft when it went public and obviously created one of the most influential nonprofits and did all sorts of things with, with that capital. But I think what's driving that is this enormous need for, for customer acquisition that's diluting founders so substantially, which is, I think, a lot of what, what the ClearBank solution is about. The other part of your question is, why aren't these companies profitable, um, is, is a, a question that I think the market's going to answer pretty clearly. I mean, you can see that their response to Lyft and Uber, which are making far less money um, than companies like Zoom and Beyond Meat, um, those have really performed much, much, much better in the public markets. And so I think, uh, I think that will just, you know, come out in the wash. It kind of comes out in the wash, but eventually, let's talk ride sharing specifically. Yeah. It's, it's real darn hard to find a model where they become profitable short of building a monopoly, pushing everyone else out, possibly regulating others out, and then being able to jack up the prices. Because otherwise, we're just going to have, let's face it, a dragon like you or a Chinese dragon or a dragon from wherever come in and compete on all of these different fronts. Somebody else comes in, they're willing to front the cash to try to fight this battle. And because you have to fight the battle, you got to cut the prices, which means you've got to cut the profits, which means you're kind of in a, a constant state of war. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a couple things that could be game changing. I think that most of the um, ride chain companies believe that, that certainly driverless cars are their future and then they take out their, their biggest cost of doing this, which is the driver itself. And, and those pilots are gonna depend on cities and, and safety and all sorts of other things. I mean, I always think it's just outrageous that you know, automobile accidents kill um, more people than almost anything else in America and there hasn't actually been more moral outrage to get us to the point of driverless cars where we can be reducing the deaths that we have on the road. Um, so I think that's coming and I think there'll be some social pressure from that. I think you're right. We can look at the world as um, you know, very competitive and it depends on who the big financier is. I still think there's a lot of room um, in segmentation for ride sharing. I mean, when I need an Uber or a Lyft, I'm like the least price insensitive customer and I'm also the one constantly getting um, you know, discounts. And so I think there's, there's a world where we can, uh, we can actually do 
there they can they can kind of figure out how to how to produce uh, you know a more profitable company out of this. I think Uber. You also have to look at how these companies were built. They were built in a way um, that was driving growth above absolutely anything else, and that's continued with the DNA. And I think that you know with different leadership that that often can change. I don't think that is the only way that these companies can survive. Let's play devil's advocate. The reason why I've heard, and it's, it's a brilliant theory. I've never heard it proposed before. But the reason why I've heard that the economy and startups specifically are geared towards this, it's not necessarily venture capital. It's more focused on the, the tax rate worldwide. So capital gains, something like 10%. Dividends, you're getting taxed like it's income. So mm-hmm. when you have a situation like that, and capital gains are three times more preferable, so to speak, and you can write off losses and all kinds of garbage, then it creates a situation where you have to have growth at growth's cost, or at all sakes, because you're optimizing for returns, even if you're not optimizing for anything else. Um, yeah, I could, I could see that. Um, although that's playing a very long-term game. I mean, these companies are taking 10 years to go public to see capital gains. Um, and so it's, I think it's just two methods to build a company. I mean, we're very focused on, you know, the top 00001% of companies that do go public. I mean, I'll give you another stat. There's 0.2% of all companies in America can raise venture capital. So there is a huge number of companies out there that we don't pay attention to, um, that I think can be great growth forces. I mean, all of these, you know, different e-commerce companies we find, I don't, I don't think that there is um, that there's only one way to to make money, and it has to be you know uh, raising an incredible amount of venture capital and then trying to take it public one day for the for the benefit of capital gains. I think that certainly um, plays as part of the incentives, but but tax structures are actually far more complicated than that, and what happens uh, throughout a company can can change quite substantially. Um, but you know, I think the other thing that that I think about is like where venture capital is deployed in America. I mean, eighty percent of VC dollars get deployed in four states in America: in California, New York, Massachusetts, and Texas. Um, and there was, I think, nine states in America last year that had no companies that got VC funding. And so I don't think you can say, well, that means there's probably no entrepreneurs in nine states in America. It probably means that that venture capital hasn't hasn't um, reached far enough. I would agree. I think part of it's mindset as well, though. So I, you're going to have certain people where th- this was a problem I saw in, in South Africa when I was working with uh, an incubator there. Yeah. And the, the issue that we saw was, it, I mean, for lack of a better term, only white entrepreneurs could afford to go big because right. everyone else was trying to just get by. And when you're in that just get by mindset, you have to focus on the, the revenue generating company. You can't go for you can't go for the home run. Mm hmm. And look, I think um, I would think of that as like a different, different. I, and I talk to this about young entrepreneurs all the time. I mean, in many ways, if you're building your first company, the, the easiest first company to build is something that can be cash flow positive, and you can, you know, earn your earn your stripes doing something that's that's doable. The hardest type of company to build is one that doesn't generate revenue for ten years, which looks closer to a social network. Um, and I think that you know you can certainly take the risk in doing those, but if you kind of want, you know, a good risk-adjusted return as an entrepreneur, you should start and get some early success and take what you're learning that you can parlay into the next business, and that also makes it um, way, way, way easier to to raise venture capital when you are a proven founder versus a first-time founder. And it's way easier to get capital come to you when you're a dragon. What was that? What, why did you decide to go on the show? You were already relatively successful at this point by all means. And then what have you learned since? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, the, the show had come and, and uh, was, was looking for me. And so they had asked me to join. And I thought it was an interesting opportunity because I had learned a lot from the show actually growing up. Like my very first pitches that I watched were watching Dragon's Den. Um, and so it was, it was kind of bizarre that it was coming full circle. And I mean, you'd yell at the TV, you'd be like, don't do that deal or do it like this. Um, and that's so much of what the show has taught the public is like, I'll get seven year old girls that will come up to me and they'll say, look, you know, Michelle, I hate eating my vegetables, but I love eating lollipops. So I'm gonna put vegetables and lollipops and then I'm gonna build a business. And although that might be a terrible idea, 
um, it, it is amazing that founders are, like and seven year olds are thinking about ideas um, this early. And so I think that that's really been the power. I think, you know, having this conclusion of that today founders need a lot of capital to, to drive ads that, you know, most founders are not going on the show looking for a dragon's help to get you into a retailer. They're really looking for help for selling online. I mean, you can actually see these big shifts season over season um, and, and how to provide alternatives to capital that, that don't just look like traditional equity structures. Talk about those shifts. What do you see in terms of the future of e-commerce? Yeah. Um, I think there is no question that, that the direct to consumer brands are here to stay and they're, I think, going to be unique depending on which country uh, that they are in. And, you know, direct to consumer is so powerful because you get, you, you no longer have to deal with the retailer. I mean, all of these companies that used to have to sell to retailers, they didn't get to, you know, meet any of their consumers or have their emails or have any sort of direct relationship. And that was the power of, of building e commerce. And then from there, um, you know, I think the other thing that we'll see is, is countries have very unique brands. And so one of, um, you know, our, our uh, board members, Raj Ruprel, um, started a company called Endy, which was effectively the Casper of Canada. And they did extraordinarily well here. I mean, in two years, they were self-funded, you know, sold to sleep country for a hundred million dollars. And, you know, it's, I think that will happen in different countries as well, where there is a local appetite for, you know, in this case, it was a product that was manufactured in Canada. Um, so I think we'll continue to see all of those trends uh, around subscription and direct-to-consumer brands. I remember seeing the absurd ads on the on the subway about <clears throat> as good as Canadian maple syrup and all kinds of yeah, weird, exactly. Weird things. But that resonated. Like I think people want want more than ever to shop local and to buy local and to understand the stories behind those products. And it's very limited when you can do that with just retailer shelf space. Um, and it's almost unlimited when you can do that on the internet with your own online experience. I have my own theory in terms of where we're headed in terms of commerce. I feel like yeah, there's, the stu- there's the stuff you care about that you give a shit about and the stuff you don't give a shit about. For, yeah. for, for the don't give a shit, it's pretty much all Amazon. We don't really care who manufactures it. I, I would yeah. probably be happier if there's not even a brand on it. But let's yeah. say- let's Yeah, say it's Amazon. like you need an iPhone cable and it just, like, it just needs to work. <laughs> I mean, and there's and nothing it just else. needs to work, but you need to have the iPhone. And let's say you're a tennis player. You've got to have like the perfect racket and the perfect shoes. But you know what? I go to work and I wear a whatever, and I've never thought about the brand of toilet paper. And my bed is a who cares a what? See, what do you yeah. what do you think in terms of that future of commerce? Is that the world that you see? Do you think see things diverging in other ways? And how does that affect? I, I mean, Amazon is kind of becoming the the everything store, literally. Um. You know, I'm always uh, hesitant when we make these big sweeping statements as like, we're building a monopoly and then a monopoly is going to be here forever. I think one of my favorite lines about Amazon is you could take every headline that's written about Amazon today and replace the word Amazon with Walmart and the exact same headline was there 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and so it, it always makes me pause because there is, there is some of this ethos in the market that, you know, especially for for non-branded products like Amazon is going to be the only place and they're certainly amazingly convenient. Um, but I think that they're still going to see competition in places that they didn't expect because that's just inevitably what happens. I mean, I don't think anyone predicted uh, the decline in Facebook um, in the last year that was, that was a total convergence of a bunch of different factors that came together to cause that. Um, and I think consumers are, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different things that we're seeing out there. We're seeing, um, you know, companies like Brandless or Public Goods that are looking at, can we just make everything cheaper and unibrand and not have any of this, um, you know, marketing behind it? I think that's, you know, showing lots of traction with consumers right now. And so even though I, I want to agree that I don't think I care where my toilet paper comes from, I think consumers are showing that there might be a few other ways that the market's going to shift out. I would agree. But if Amazon wanted to do their own Public Goods deal, then the public's I, I'm an excellent investor in public goods and that they would be in trouble. And that's just kind of the nature of having that. I think the Walmart Amazon analogy is really good, but I think it's lacking in terms of the, the network effect that's built into it, especially with Alexa and voice tech. Yeah. And I think that's what, 
um, every country, every company would always have you believe when they are at the top of the monopoly, right? And it feels like they're growing bigger. And then there is always a surprise uh, that takes some of that dominance away. And I don't exactly know what that is. I mean, I think with voice, there is an enormous concern around privacy as there are with, with a bunch of other things um, that could be a, a big risk mitigation factor there. Um, you know, Amazon has uh, launched their own private label goods. I know that they launched their own private label um, mattress to compete with Casper. Uh, I don't think it has had the same, you know, traction that they, that they thought it was going to have. Um, and so there is, um, there is something around uh, brand and there is always some surprises. And so I would just say never, never, never say never on this one. <laughs> I would agree, but just as someone who did Amazon, that there's an exponential growth in the number of Amazon basics products. They're basically just ripping people's sales data and copying products. A hundred percent. And then you get to put, I think, I, I think they're going to have to deal or governments are going to have to deal with a whole multi-sided marketplace that also is competing because then they have the inherent monopoly Advantage. effect. Yeah, that they, they, they win no matter who wins. And that's when you're in a situation where it's very dangerous. And I think, and I think governments um, don't quite know what to do at this point. I mean, they are, there is going to be more regulation on digital businesses, no doubt, because they are just, they have such enormous troves of data right now. Um, and I don't think ever anyone thought about what to do with this. And so I think it's, I think, yeah, that regulation is certainly going to happen to Amazon. It's going to happen to Google. It's going to happen to Facebook. Uh, and we don't quite know how that's going to shake out. No, we don't. And if it's done wrong, it screws a lot of things up, but going, no back, kidding. going back to that seven year old with a sucker, tell yeah. me, tell me what it's like. I, I got to imagine you're one of the youngest women in the room, especially when you got started with Dragon's Den. What was it like in being a, a woman in tech uh, a couple of years back and now today? How have things changed? And what what do you want to see change? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So I was the youngest dragon when I joined the show in 28 different countries where the show was made. So it was like, I was really young. I was... Um, and, um, and I think, you know, it's, it's incredible from the sense that you can get a lot of young women to look up to you and, and have these stories. Like I want to create the, the veggie, um, lollipop company. Um, and I think that, uh, that there, that there certainly are some challenges. I mean, women get 2% of venture capital. I have, um, not been of the belief that we can solve that by sitting on panels and talking about the moral imperatives or talking about why it's a good business decision. We actually have to fund more women. Those women have to produce, you know, incredible outcomes. And then the market, you know, just kind of takes over. And so I think one of the unique things, um, about the clear bank model is that when we fund companies, um, you know, we funded over a thousand companies to date, this year will be a, will be a billion dollars in funding. Um, we just look at data. I mean, you need to plug in your online e-commerce digital data to us, and then we can make a decision whether you have good unit economics and, and how much capital we can give you. And because we're not doing these face-to-face -face meetings, we've taken a lot of the bias out of decision-making. And so I actually remember pulling this number, you know, six months ago where I was like, guys, like, let's just look at what the breakdown of the founders are. And we had funded eight times more women than the venture capital industry average. And I thought that was pretty incredible because that just came out of taking the bias out of decision making. It didn't come from, you know, changing the funnel at the top or sourcing more women or going after, it actually just came from, from changing the decision making process. So I think there'll be a few of these solutions that will end up making um, probably a really big difference because, you know, women have an enormous amount of, of insight and technology. And buying power, let's face it. I, yeah, I would 80, imagine. 80 to 90% of the household buying power is women. And yeah, I don't, don't want to buy anything. <laughs> well, neither do I. But, you know, every one of us needs to have toilet paper in our house. So someone has to do it. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. And then on the flip side, we, we, went to the, we went to the Children's Museum here in Atlanta last weekend. And there were a couple of different areas for for all of these kids one of them was like the super engineering it was it was like the greatest thing ever it was like that mouse trap game if you remember it when you were younger with the pinballs going around spinning yeah. around catching the yeah. mouse all kinds of craziness filled with little boys one or two girls mm -hmm. and then you have right next door the kitchen and the yeah. the supermarket filled with girls a couple right. of boys and it's 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 hard because 
some of it's societal and some of it's biologic, uh, mm -hmm. biological, not biologic. And it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to separate and tease those out because you don't want to force the girl who wants to be an artist to go into STEM if she doesn't want to go into STEM. Totally. Um, I think there's a few ways to think about this. I think we need to teach girls about what it means to be brave. I think a lot of that, uh, you know, you could argue is biological, but a lot of that can be taught. I mean, all of us can grow our ability to take risk. And I think that um, is one of the biggest things. I mean, you watch those same kids at the playground and the boys are jumping off the swing set and the girls are being really cautious. And, you know, that, that courage and that bravery, um, I think is a, is a huge deal in women going forward. I would also make a, a different argument on, on STEM. I mean, I was an engineer. Uh, I thought it was, I don't think I really wanted to be an engineer. My parents uh, highly encouraged me to be an engineer. I was, maybe I'll put it lightly that way. Um, and I thought that was enormously useful for me because when you go to school and you get a science and math background, um, first of all, business numbers are exceptionally easy. I mean, doing ratios with a lot of zeros in your head is much, much, much easier than doing linear algebra. <laughs> and so it gave me a fluidity and confidence with numbers that I think is something that often women lack. Um, and then the other thing is that I think, you know, learning science in school is is important because you can always learn arts later. And we're, we are artists in many ways our whole lives. And it's very much easier to, to, to read and pick up books later. You know, no one kind of very rarely do people go out later and start reteaching themselves organic chemistry kind of stuff. Um, and so I think that that's uh, one of the values of, of really stressing a STEM education, especially for women. I like it, but I would also push back. And I think I think if you look at schools and you look at kids, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's some type of transition that happens between that three-year-old age to that eight-year-old age where they go from being creative, take on the world and do magic to mm -hmm. suddenly just like a little mini version of an adult. And yeah. I, think, I think it's killing the creativity. That one TED talk that Sir, what's his name did, was incredibly, mm -hmm. incredibly beneficial. So I think in some ways... That in some ways, STEM is very, very important. Yeah. But I don't know what we cut out to make that more important while also keeping creativity there because we're, we're, past the, we're past the factory for the factory workers mentality of education. At least we have to be. Totally. We have to be. And, and I think then my challenge to you would be, I think there's a lot of creative ways to teach science and math that do not take the creativity out of those subjects. I do not think that the science in its very nature is not route learning. Of course, we can like establish what we know, but the way we discover things is the most creative process in science. I mean, a lot of, be it drugs or innovations, were started by accident. And they were started with a lot of creativity um, in terms of like, you know, how we built the first airplane and how we did all sorts of things. Um, and so I think there is, I think that is the challenge to educators is how do you, produce creativity um you know in the stem field because i think that can exist just as much as it can in the arts i would agree there as well i would like to see classes being more mixed in terms of not just ages but also subjects why do we have a science class and a math class and a history class why don't we right. talk about the science that was happening during the middle ages and then go build a rocket and shoot down someone's castle right so sounds a little bit more fun if we can netflixify it but diy then i think it can be a, it can be a better experience for everybody Totally. What technologies are you most excited about outside of the stuff we've talked to today? Oh. And why? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's, um, it's really hard to know because we've kind of like, we're kind of on the precipice of a bunch of it, right? We've seen like the initial applications of like driverless cars, but like nothing's really like been totally commercialized right now. Uh, except what you can do in a Tesla. You know, we've seen some of the early stages of, um, you know, VR, but it's like not, it's not well established on what we're going to use all of that environments for. Um, and I think probably, you know, especially in Canada, some of the discoveries that have been made on the AI side and some of the things we can do with data science now um, are probably the, the most exciting and the most scary. Um, and then the last piece of technology that's hard, that's hard to miss is, um, what's going to happen with blockchain? And, you know, I think that 
ICOs were completely overhyped, but the core technology of itself was in some ways very underhyped um, because what we can do when we eliminate, um, you know, two-sided databases and make one public ledger is like universally applicable. I mean, this is, this is a technology that's the size of the internet all over again. And so it's been really surprising to see the way that that industry has taken this like absolute boom and bust cycle. Um, but I still think that we're gonna, I would still be betting on some of the core blockchain technology companies. And, and I think there's gonna be really interesting things that will happen that will be totally unexpected in, in that field. Do you think the technology of blockchain is more exciting or the mindset? I think a lot of it's just the ability to think about creating something trustless that's more important than the actual application of it. Yeah, I think you're probably right um, that that it is this idea that we could eliminate all of these, you know, from back office functions to, you know, a perfect insurance contract that you didn't need to negotiate with your insurance company, like something just the, the switch is flipped to the smart contract. Um, this idea of airdrops, I think, is amazing. I mean, you think about that. Uh, from like a public policy, you know, perspective. Think about a country that's either gone through a war or a natural disaster. The ability to drop a currency into everyone's phone in like 10 seconds immediately is is revolutionary in terms of what we've done in terms of foreign aid. Like there's so many interesting applications um, that we can get from there. I think that's probably, at least for me, having now been in FinTech is probably the most exciting to watch. You said you're worried about AI and automation? Oh, you know, you, you, you get a, you get a positive story and then a negative story. Where do you, where do you net out on this one? I think the people that are sell it as positive are incredibly naive or very, very arrogant in their own abilities. I find it incredibly stupid to be able to make an, first of all, absolute statements are in general always false or yeah. generally speaking a terrible idea. But when, mm -hmm. when you're contemplating something that you're, you're, assuming will be smarter and more creative than you to say you've thought of all of the possible ways it could go wrong when that doesn't even happen with regard to other humans. I think that's just foolish and naive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think we have done any planning on how wrong it can go. Um, but it's also hard. It's, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine at all. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, it's a black swan event. You can't really, anticipate what happens after something like that. Mm -hmm. Totally. What do you think about UBI? UBI? Universal basic income. You mentioned airdrops. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Universal basic income. Um, you know, universal basic income works if we eliminate, let's go back. So universal basic income works if we eliminate the part of the government that is basically making individual decisions on how we spend social dollars. And if we could get that part right, I think universal basic income may work. But I don't think we have you know, good data today. Actually, there was a couple places in Canada that did some good pilots on universal basic income. Um, I think in the prairies and a few other places where it was very effective. Um, but the whole idea behind it is if you don't eliminate the bureaucracy that's making these current decisions to date, like we can't just add universal basic income to all of the social um, programs we have today. There's just not enough tax revenue coming in to be able to do that. But if we get a, get rid of the bureaucracy and basically say, look, this is the amount of capital that everyone gets um, from the state for paying into this tax paying system, um, and we eliminate the costs associated with basically doing this with a series of incredibly inefficient government programs, uh, I think there's a shot. I just don't think that it's quite being tested in that way. And I think... Um, I think we're going to have to do way more research to figure out, you know, is there a difference in people that can get universal basic income and, you know, do they choose to um, work on great creative problems and build something else or, you know, do they get distracted and play video games all day long? And so I think there's, there, but there's lots of cool pilots going on that I think we'll be able to see with that. We get distracted and play video games all day long. Yeah. If we get to a world of more pure automation, that might actually be favorable. It's a uh, sad, yeah. sad, but possibly true. It is. What? It is. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's this great line that like an empty mind is the devil's workshop. So you really, um, you really want to be creating interesting things for people to be building and working on and, and problems that are bigger than themselves, um, 
which is keeping societies out of problems for a lot of years. Speaking of problems, what are the biggest problems you see in society today? Well, it depends on which part of the world we're looking at. I mean, and that's, that's part of the problem of the stratification. Like, there is a lot of parts of the world that are still having um, problems with, you know, basic health and water sanitations and um, all sorts of, you know, what I'd lump into kind of the basic human needs. And then, um, you know, in North America, you look at just the problems on, like, distracting and like the way that cell phones are completely destroying our brains where we're kind of in this, you know, it is incredibly difficult to do deep work as someone who, you know, has to live on a little bit of my phone for work. I even am finding it harder. And I mean, I was trained as a pianist as a kid. I had so many activities that were basically driving like deep work and focus and discipline. And I'm even finding that harder and harder. And I think that that's um, probably going to be one of the biggest things is how do we get um, our brains and our relationships back to be to be very focused because we're not you know driving in that direction today. I think we need a default no notification feature. That that's what I do with my phone. I essentially will check email from time to time, use it for WhatsApp, even the text messages don't. For some reason, actually, I would like those to notify, but they don't notify. But yeah. it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of beautiful because if you live in that backwards paradigm, but you do it today, then you can choose when you want to have the forwards. Yeah, I, I think so well. So so what has worked for you besides turning off notifications? Turn off notifications. I have a Chrome extension called Newsfeed Eradicator. So on Facebook, the only thing I can use it for essentially is messaging people. Um, hmm, let's see, what else? Notifications. I like reducing the screen brightness with something like Flux. Yeah. Um, any other things in terms of, obviously you don't want to have any type of social media on your phone. It's just tracking mm -hmm. you and giving you notifications. No Twitter, no Facebook, no Instagram, no Pinterest. In mm -hmm. general, I only broadcast on Twitter. I don't actually respond to all of that much because that right. would, I mean, that's where you get all of the negativity from. And yeah. then having some type of focused music or headphones in mm -hmm. when you're working on something. I can't have words, so it has to be like bio I, I can't or have classic words music or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's hard. Look, these are... Um, you know, social media is an incredible double-edged sword, especially as, as a public figure. I mean, people know me in Canada as a dragon and, and I do update my Instagram and I show people where I'm going um, and what I'm doing and what I'm working on. And I try and give, you know, advice when I walk out of a really terrible meeting and I'm like, oh, this would be like a good, good story to share. Um, and it's built, uh, it's built an incredible following and an incredible tool where I can communicate with a lot of Canada. And so that's very powerful. But then, you know, you get your brain hijacked when you're, you know, seeing instant messages and responding um, and you're not focused on what really matters. I think the other thing that works for me really well is like, I still use a paper notebook and I still use a post-it note that I make a to-do list. And if you sit there without your phone and without your laptop and you're just like, ah, what do I need to do today? What are the three things that will really drive you know, could, could really drive my business to a, to a totally different level. And, and I'm going to do the three hardest things first in the day. Uh, and I think that that's been a really important practice that I've never given up because I just find that when your computer is just too full with stuff to do and messages and enormous amount of communication, um, it's doing what, what really matters that counts. Yeah. Eat shit first or something like that. That was the book, right? Yeah. It's, uh, get the, get the important stuff done first. Yeah. Bite the bullet. Exactly. And then your, and then your whole day gets easier. Exactly. What would be a bold prediction you have 10 years from now that most people wouldn't hold? Um, I mean, I don't, I think that we're going to see a lot, a, a lot less equity funding. That would be my bold prediction is that uh, it is totally unsustainable to have founders owning, you know, a couple of percentage points of their company by the time they go public. So I think we're going to see the rise of, of a lot of companies um, that look similar to us that are using data in a very different way to make investing decisions. That would be one of my uh, old predictions. Do you worry at all? So you guys are using data, which is incredibly valuable, but it has the double-edged sword of when we're using data to come up with who gets different prison sentences and not really considering 
the, the, there's kind of the, the there's kind of the pros and the cons. It depends on the, the data you feed it. So for investing, it's slightly different. But for other things, people trust algorithms a lot these days. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think we compare ourselves to the world of equity investing, where you have to give the same, if not more, data, and you have to give it, you know, over spreadsheets and hours and hours of diligence calls. And to raise an average equity round takes you two months of being on the road. Um, and for us, it takes you know a month of uh, you know, it takes a month. And so I think that, um, I think that that's kind of a, a wash there. I think we do need to be very, very careful with, uh, other companies and, and where that data is, uh, is going and how we're using it. If you were to drop off of clear bank, have a hundred million dollars to go and solve a big world problem, what company or problem would you build to do? Oh, um, it's a great question. I would, um, you know, I've seen kind of the power of access to capital, and I think that applies, you know, globally as well. Um, and I actually don't think, I think that someone needs to build the universal global credit score uh, for people from literally every village around the globe um, and the ability to get access to whether it's to buy a goat, whether it's to buy, you know, a tiny parcel of land or something else. I think there's actually a lot um, of good that can be done there when we give, you know, identity and credit score into parts of the world that, that have never had that done. And credit scores are actually even very broken in North America. So you would, you would want to revamp uh, the entire system. So I think that would be a cool project to work on. Especially revamp it so that the person who you never entered into a contract with doesn't have your data and the ability to sell your data or oh my god and then the ability to charge you because they lost your data bizarre like uh, terrible the way that this has happened the chief security officer had a degree in art no i mean and then they they um you know the credit score companies in america had lobbied the u.s government to have this monopoly effectively and then as soon as they got in trouble for their breach of data they said well we never wanted this to begin with it's like guys you cannot talk out of both sides of your mouth right you either take your responsibility seriously and apologize for it but um yeah no it's uh it, that that is 100 percent true does that scare you at all the the kind of evolution we're moving towards, it's not exactly, it's not crony capitalism, but we're moving towards that closer merger of government and corporation, especially on the tech side. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, look, there's been bad actors since the beginning of time, and I still think we have, you know, a really strong uh, journalistic system, despite all of the attacks that it's under with, um, with different sorts of fake news. Um, but this is not going to be a simple world going forward because the government governments have also not done a good job of regulating companies that are global because that would mean that global governments have to cooperate, which is why, you know, challenges like climate change are such a big deal. And it's why, you know, challenges like regulating um, tech companies that are global in nature are going to be a problem. But we are going to see some stuff here. I mean, you know, GDPR was a really good first step that uh, everyone has had to become compliant after. Um, and then after that, you, you start to see other regulations that are based on, you know, the same kind of metrics. And so I think, uh, I think we will figure this one out. It's not going to be pleasant, but, but I think it will certainly happen. So you left San Francisco to move to Toronto. Why? Yeah, we started, uh, we started ClearBank out of San Francisco out of the YC Fellowship. And, um, and I will always have a part of my heart there. But for us, it was, a, it was a big competitive advantage to build in Toronto. Toronto has an incredible talent ecosystem. Um, you know, we are certainly known uh, quantities here. And it, we've had a lot of success being able to build kind of a, a global team. The other thing about Canada is that Canada is 2% of the global economy. And so everyone here has to think about how to build a global company first. Because if you're going to build a company just for Canada, it, it can't by definition be that big. Um, and so I think, you know, our first market was the US, our second market was Canada, our third market was the UK. Um, and there's this mentality here of, of building for the world. And I, I think that's been really positive. It's the Sweden effect. When you're so small, you've got to go big. Yeah, yeah, the Sweden effect, the Israel effect. Like there's a few countries um, that have really uh, nailed down on this. But I think it's been, been one of our advantages. I got to be honest, I think you missed a couple of the key advantages, the healthcare system in Canada, the diversity, the, and the overall friendliness of the people. I, I yeah. liked it a lot. And how, how would you contrast that with San Francisco? Because I've heard it's kind of turning into a shithole. Um, 
You know, San Francisco, and, and thank you, uh, Canadians are very friendly. Uh, that is 100% true. Sometimes that makes them a little less assertive and aggressive, which is not always a positive in a business thing. So I like to say I have a little bit of New York and a little bit of Toronto in me. Um, you know, healthcare is, is really important and certainly, uh, and certainly a, a big part of that um, and the way that has worked. I think uh, it's hard to be in San Francisco and just appreciate that more wealth has been created in the Bay Area in the last you know, 30 years and almost anywhere else on the planet. And to kind of see this state of like disarray that the city is in between, um, you know, homelessness and between the housing crisis. And it's like, you know, the effect compounds because, you know, companies have to raise more money because they have to pay software developers more and the software developers are getting paid more, but they're not keeping that income. It's all going to landlords. And then they have landlords that are voting on these you know, city notific or city um, rules where you can't build up because they want to protect uh, the price of their land. And so I think, um, you know, if San Francisco doesn't do something creative, I think it's going to go through a point, um, you know, where it's just going to be totally unsustainable uh, to live there. But look, there is, there is nothing that will replace Silicon Valley. It is a super important part of us to be connected to. Um, but I think it is really hard to see that, that uh, the wealth that has been created has not you know, has not gone to solving the problems. It's actually made a lot of them a lot worse. Could that bubble bring down Silicon Valley? I don't know. I don't know. Typically, probably not. Typically, those those things go through reshapes before they bring down entire economies. But, um, you know, and there's still so much of California's economy that's highly diversified. Uh, but I think that we will see other tech cities that are that are doing right well that that will be able to compete. Um, you know, New York has been a great market. I mean, Atlanta, where are you from? There, I just met the um, the CEO of Mailchimp, and that was a company that was proudly built in Atlanta, totally self funded. You know, billion dollar company to date. Um, and so we'll start seeing and hearing a lot more of those stories because uh, it is not sustainable to run a startup and have you know, engineers walk in and say, well, look, I need to get paid $150,000 more. I'm walking because I had, you know, one piece of 2% negative feedback. <laughs> That's not, not, companies have to be, you know, more resilient than that uh, to kind of make it to the next level. And so I think that that's, um, there's going to be some big shifts would be my prediction. I can't remember if it was Facebook or Google, but one of the companies, at least for a while, and I think even still today, had a policy where if the other one offered you a uh, essentially a salary increase, they would double it. And I think double like the entire salary that was being offered. It was, it was That's just extraordinary, absurdly Ponzi schematic. But when you have something with almost zero operating costs, I guess you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, it's like anything else. You can do it in, in, until as long as that party ends. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think there's going to be a few more costs in, um, in in those platforms that, that are still to come the wolf of wall street could only snort so much cocaine before he had to come down so uh, <laughs> this has been a, this has been a fun one before you tell people where to find you i want yeah. one last piece of advice quote call to action something of that nature yeah i think um if you're an entrepreneur if you want to be an entrepreneur you should always start the number of folks that reach out to me saying i've had this idea for you know five years. I'm like, what have you been doing? Like the world is changing so quickly. I think um, that would always be my advice is to just start now. As soon as you get going, you figure out how to iterate and you figure out how to build something. Um, but you can't, you can't start that process until you get started. And do not be one of those people that mortgages your house or your future to build a business. Yeah. Do not take a personal guarantee. That's why ClearBank exists. <laughs> it's terrible when you see that on the show. It's, uh, it's such a big, big, oh God. And people, people do it all the time or the, or, or even more common, don't start the business. Michelle, yeah. I feel like you're a super inspirational woman and you've got someone, something to leave people with. So where's the best place for people to find you? Yeah. So, um, my Instagram is probably the most active. It's Michelle, M I C H E L E just one L in Michelle and then Romano R O M A N O W. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook or, um, or any of the other social channels. Very good. Very good. I would still like for you to go with like Canadian czar or the Canadian dragon. Czar. <laughs> something, something like that. Let's, let's bring back the evil empire. Thanks, exactly. uh, thanks for coming on today, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for tuning in guys. If you guys have enjoyed it, remember to leave a review in iTunes, support us on Patreon, 
And if you're an advertiser interested in advertising to our awesome listeners, then reach out, matt at disruptors.fm. Till next time, cheers. Awesome. That was good. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Is there any?